Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful once again that we can come together, that we can open your word, and that we can have the fellowship of your spirit, and that we can be directed and guided in our day-to-day -day lives by you. We ask for your presence in this study, and that you can continue to enlighten our minds, and we pray for each person. You know the struggles we face, and we just ask, Lord, that uh, you can come close to each one of us and help us in the battles of life. Be with us in this study to uh, clearly understand these things, and we ask that you can guide and direct on the things we study. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning once again. Now, yesterday the study was, well, you know, it was good in, in that we, we could put some things in there. There's lots of things that that I'm not certain about. You know, hopefully we can we can sort some of these things out. Now, the first thing, of course, the historical application uh, is something that obviously this movement has understood for a long time in that, uh, you know, we understand that this this is about the Sunday law. And yet there are some details that we have that we wouldn't have seen in the historical application. So, for instance, just the number H776 is the number of cardinal days from November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 1991. And so when we have this, uh, he, papal Rome, now shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries. That's the USSR. And we understand that. Now we have their papal Rome. Now, of course, we could have just put in like the king of the north. And, and the king of the north represents both the papacy and the United States, but but here we just put papal Rome, which should, we put it as the main power, because in a sense the papacy conquers the United States. Uh, any thoughts on that of our historical understanding of that? Now stretching forth his hand, uh, we looked at that, and what does it mean to stretch forth the hand? So, so the idea is to extend your reach. <clears throat> to extend your reach, or to... yeah, I mean the idea is that you're sending forth your hand, and uh, we know that there are some symbols there. Uh, extending you know, your influence. I'm sorry. What go go on, Jeff? I was just saying extending your influence, extending influence. Okay. Now we know in. Uh, the threefold union at the Sunday, uh, the Sunday law, the United States is going to stretch forth its hand as well, right? Yes. It's going to stretch its hand, reach across the abyss. It's going to, uh, I can't remember the exact phrasing. And it's always the USA that stretches forth its hand. So maybe there's some ways in which we should, we should think this through a little bit more than it just being papal Rome. You understand what I'm saying? So we have an interpretation of, of these verses that this movement has held on to for a long time. And, and I'm not saying that it's wrong, but I'm just saying that there's maybe more there than what we, what we have seen. So if we take the position, so let's, here, let's just go to the Bible itself here instead of our paper. Um, just, uh, just a note that Jeff heard he was speaking at the weekend from Isaiah chapter 11 where it talks about the Lord will stretch forth his hand the second time to gather the remnant of his people. Yeah. So I'm, so I'm wondering if there's anything. Now he was applying it to us after July 18. They're still scattered and they're gathering. Now things are being gathered again. I think he, he puts it to it July 2023. Yeah, when, when, he, started, when he published his uh, first article. Yes. So I'm just wondering, is there anything there you could connect with that, you know, with the, what it says there about the gathering time, with this here stretching forth of the hand? Yeah. So, okay. So, um, so if we look at, uh, Isaiah chapter 11. Now, of course, um, 
when we look at Ellen White, what she says about it. Yeah, I think Jeff, he puts it down as if she's written writing it, writing it in uh, 1849. And uh, I think we had a... Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. He was saying 1849. So that's my understanding. Yeah, it was uh, October 1850, wasn't it? It said September. Yeah, it's October uh, 23rd, 1850. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think he was making uh, an error there, tying it to 1849. Yeah. But, But go ahead. But also what Ellen White says about it, because she actually explains it in other places. And, and, um, okay, so this is an important verse, Isaiah 11, 11. And the reason why it's important is it's Isaiah 11, 11 as a symbol, right? So we know that 11 and 11 is a division of 22, a symbol of restoration. Now, the problem with, with, with what Jeff would be doing to try to apply it in the way that he is, is he's ignoring lots of other things. I mean, because anybody could just take this and say, yeah, this is this is applying to what's happening now. Uh, and we're the ones who are, you know, God's gathering us, right? So you need something solid to place this. But we, we also recognize that there are symbols here because it ties us to Daniel 11, 11 as well, right? So it ties us to the symbol dealing with Raphia. And, uh, of course, it brings us back to the story of Joseph, the 22 years with 11 years from when he sold into slavery, then to interpret the dreams of the butler and baker, and then the further 11 years in which, which his dreams are fulfilled. So we know that, that that's a symbol of restoration. And of course, the 11 generations to the flood and 11 generations to going into Egypt. Anyway, it says, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And the envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. So this is about a restoration of the movement. Now, we we apply this to Adventism, but originally, what is this application for? When is the second time in, you know, what that Isaiah is, is actually referring to historically? Okay, when's the first time, according to Isaiah? Christ's coming, the first and second time. No, the, the first time would just be when they came from Egypt, right? When God called his people the first time. The second time is the call out of Babylon, right? The Babylonian captivity. If you look at historically in the context and what he's talking about, he, he's going to be talking about the fact Israel's going to go into captivity again, and then they're going to be called out of captivity. So historically, just in, in the immediate context, it's going to be referring to the fact that they're going that the, the end of the Babylonian captivity. That's what it's going to be addressing. Now it becomes typical of something else, right? But historically, it's the Babylonian captivity. Does that make sense to people, or do people disagree with that? Because it is typical of something else, but it's just literally talking about what's going to happen with the Bab- after the fall of Babylon. A- any thoughts on that? Okay, so what is it primarily typifying then? The call out of Babylon is typifying what event? So where do we generally apply this once we look at this branch, you know, this rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots? So where do we normally apply that? Well, that would be the birth of Christ. Yeah, so so it's going to refer to the first coming of Christ. So we know that, and, and this is the second time. So what it's going to do, what Isaiah is going to do for this chapter is it's going to say what happened with the delivery, deliverance from Egypt, from that bondage. It's, it's going to happen again. And he's primarily initially addressing coming out of Babylon. 
but then it becomes typical of what happens with the first coming of Christ. But we know that not everything here is fulfilled in the first coming of Christ, that it also typifies the second coming of Christ, right? If we're going to take everything that's in this chapter, you know, the wolf shall dwell also, also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. I mean, we could try to interpret that in some symbolic way, but we know that, that this is referring to the end, right? He's going to smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So this is the second coming of Christ as well. So he has tied up in this deliverance from Egypt and from Babylon types of the first coming and the second coming mixed together. Right? And we, we see that in Isaiah a lot, that the first coming and the second coming are mixed together. Okay, so why is that? Why are they mixed together? It's a simple, simple answer. It's not a complicated one. What's the relationship between the first coming and the second coming? Well, one, he, he comes as a suffering servant, and the other is a king. Okay, yeah. So, so they're part of a prophecy that, in a sense, one typifies the other. So we know that the Jews expected Christ to just come as a king, set up his kingdom, and overthrow the Romans, right? But, but there are two aspects to it. That is, and this is one of the things that I find really difficult that people who criticize, let's say, the investigative judgment, don't seem to to take into account. Most Christians will recognize the idea that the first and second coming represent, that are represented by the same symbols in many places in Scripture, right? And, and we saw this with Wagner when we were studying his his thing, where he, he couldn't sort of differentiate the idea that, you know, Christ can come as a, you know, in in a sense, take his kingdom in the first coming, but really he doesn't take up his throne in in the ultimate sense until the second coming, right? So he just tried to say, well, everything has already happened. Christ has already been slain as the lamb, right? He's already king. You know, we don't need this investigative judgment. But the reality is, just like with the investigative judgment, it isn't representing just a single day, right? The day of atonement. It's actually representing a period of time, which is a process in which God accomplishes things step by step prophetically. So what people will do is they will take, they will take things out of their context and try to place them in a specific point and not recognize that these, these things don't represent a, sin, a single point that they represent something that's happening over a period of time. So we can see that this has many applications. It literally is addressing the fact that just like they came out of Egypt, they're going to go into Babylonian captivity and come out of Babylon. But that is also typifying what's going to happen at the first coming of Christ, which is also typifying what's going to happen at the second coming of Christ. You know, I don't know the particulars of what what Jeff is doing, but, you know, there's often this, when Ellen White explains it, maybe I should go through, uh, because it's in early writings where she explains this. So let me go there. Um, And and this is an important point for what we're studying right now. So you'll, you'll see as we go through this, it'll come back around. I think we had noted it before that uh, set his yeah. hand as three zero three seven. Yes, which which is yeah March twenty seventh as a symbol. Yeah, the stretching out of the hand. Yeah, there yeah. it says set his hand. Is that the same in the uh, language in the Hebrew as in, 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 in Isaiah eleven eleven? Yes. With Daniel. Okay, this one doesn't actually say stretch his hand. This one just says hand. Um, cause it says it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord's, and it doesn't, so they added, you know, in a sense, set. Um, and, and so his hand, it doesn't have stretch forth his hand here. Right. But, but we're going to look at that. Okay. So he's going to set his hand or he gives his hand again. 
uh, the second time, right? So uh, to recover the remnant of his people. So we're, we're going to have to look at that. But for right now, let's just look at this. Uh, okay, I'm just not sure exactly where she makes the explanation. I'll show you this. So early writings, page 74. Of course, she says September 23rd, and that becomes a symbol um, just because September is the seventh month, and uh, it's going to represent uh, 273. So it's going to represent... You know, 723 BC, it's going to represent uh, March 27th. It's going to also um, be on September 23rd, 2017, 777 days before November 9th. But we know it's actually October 23rd and it's 1850. So it's, it's six years to the day from when Hiram Edson has his vision of the cornfield. And, and we've addressed the six years before in, in our lines as well. And it's just a typo because it probably would have said in the original writing of this, I-N-S-T, which means instant, or in this uh, month, the 23rd. And because there was a bunch of documents, it seems that James White, in putting it in the, in the, the present truth periodical, that he actually just got the month wrong. And then that, that typo has continued to persist. And as far as I know, we're the first ones that noticed this um, and can date this as actually October 23rd, 1850, instead of September 23rd. Though other people should have noticed, but they just don't seem to think it through. But anyway, so she says, uh, the Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people. Now, notice she uses the word stretched out his hand, but in in the King James, it doesn't have, or in the Hebrew, it doesn't have stretched out. It just set his hand, right? But she uses stretched out. So we're going to consider that that, by inspiration, can be applied. And that efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time. In the scattering, Israel was smitten and torn, but now in the gathering time, God will heal and bind up his people. In the scattering, efforts were made to spread the truth, but it had little effect, accomplished, but little or nothing. But in the gathering, when God has set his hand, so here she's going to say, set his hand, as it says in the King James, to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their designed effect. All should be united and zealous in the work. I saw that it was wrong for any to refer to the scattering for examples to govern us now in the gathering. For if God should do no more for us now than he did then, Israel would never be gathered. I've seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered and that the figures were as he wanted them, but his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. Now, you can see in this statement that we can apply it to this movement, because we can parallel what happened in 1844 with what has happened in this movement at this time. So we should be able to make an application of it, but we can make a wrong application of it. Now, she's going to comment on this, of what she meant. So here she says, um, the view that the Lord had stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people on page 74 refers only to the union and strength once existing among those looking for Christ and to the fact that he had begun to unite and raise up his people again. Now, if we are going to, and we'll come back to Daniel chapter 11 here, but just in reference to what Ellen White is saying here, that she's she's not making this broad application of this verse. She's taking this verse and making an application to their time. That's what's happening? Yes. Okay. And so they were united in giving the message of July 18, right, or October 22nd, 1844. And God has to unite and raise up his people again. Now, this is the thing that all through that history that we were seeking to accomplish, Right. So it's pretty difficult 
for the Adventists at this time, you know, to see to see the vast majority of the movement rejecting October 22nd, 1844. But if we are going to parallel that with our history, do we see Miller as part of this stretching out his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people, right? So if Jeff is going to apply it to our history and parallel it with Millerite history, where would the parallel be? Well, Miller was dead at that time, 1850. Yeah. Yes, I understand. Right, so he's dead. But even even then, you know, just just taking the idea that you don't take Miller as a person, just take the movement that Miller had created. It is not, there's nothing that would parallel with what Jeff is saying that we could look at Millerite history and find that. Except if we are to take those that hold on to the prediction that was made. Right. So the real big problem I have with Jeff's application is we don't see what he sees in Millerite history. We don't see Miller going off, uh, getting distracted by something, a false prediction being made, and then uh, Miller coming back and saying, you know, you need to rally around me again, right? We just don't see that. So as you're, you're correct, Miller, Miller has passed away. Now, when did Miller pass away? What year? It was, it wasn't it in 49 or was it 46? I always forget. It was the, the 20th of December, 1849. Okay. Right. Okay. So the 20th December, 1849. Yeah. So this is going to be after Miller has passed away. Yeah. 46, that must have been when James and Ella White got married. I'm just trying to remember all these different dates. August 31st, thank you. Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> so anyway, there's no way that we can make an application to the movement in the way that Jeff is. So it's just, just a point. But we, we can make an application to what has happened. So within this movement, but that would mean that that union and strength that once existed under July 18th still has to exist under that message. So a rejection of July 18th could not possibly fulfill this, just like a rejection of October 22 couldn't fulfill this. Now, Jeff tries to apply July 18th to the first disappointment, from what I understand, from what I've read, which doesn't really make sense because is Miller's first prediction a faulty prediction that was, you understand what I'm saying? It, it just doesn't really make sense. But anyway, this is, this is what it says here. And if we go back to Daniel chapter 11, so when he's going to stretch forth his hand, we actually have a word there, shalak, which just means to send out his hand. Now we do have the United States stretches forth its hand. And, um, you know, we have that in the great controversy. Okay, so uh, through two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring under his decept, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of the threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. So here in verse 42, when it says he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, would we put that as... I don't know. How would how would we apply that? Like we have here the 776 countries. So, so that's the word for countries or uh, land, right? At its and we have this stretching forth his hand upon the countries. Is this is this the union of the United States with the papacy against the USSR? I guess that is the question. Does that make 
the most sense. Well, verse 42 is laughter, Sunday law. So I see it as more just stretching forth their uh, gathering the nations under sacred Sunday sacredness. The spiritualism okay. there, the spiritualism you mentioned. We know that El White, she says that the dragon power is nations, peoples, whatever, nations, kings. So in a sense, it's the nations of the world, dragon power, that would be representing spiritualism. We know that there's spiritualism associated with the United Nations. So um, that's how I would understand that. So that's taking place after. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I understand that. Now, we know that, that things are not, that there's often repeat and enlarge in, in scripture. Yes. Okay. So we're going to have two different things. Uh, he's going to stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Right. So we're going to say the land of Egypt is the UN. Now we know the Soviet Union is, is the dragon power, but it's going to be the UN. That's actually going to be the dragon power at the end. That is, the Soviet Union is going to be conquered first. And then that dragon power is going to move to the UN. Right. So, so I, I wouldn't just say it, it's after the Sunday law, because first we have a Sunday law in the United States. Right. That's what we're going to have here in verse 41. Then you have a universal Sunday law after that. Well, well, then you're going to have, yeah, the Sunday law that goes to the whole world. And then, and then finally you're going to have the death decree Sunday law, um, after the close of probation. So, okay, Stephen. So, uh, first 40, the, the going into the, the countries there. Mm-hmm. It's like a, an incomplete work, but here it's more complete. Can you say that? Yeah, well, and actually in verse 40, it doesn't have the word countries at all. It does in the King James, but not in the Hebrew. So it says, uh, he shall enter also into the glorious land. So we know that this is the papacy. Well, that's uh, verse 41. Of verse 41, pardon me. Oh, yeah, right, back in verse 40. Okay. In, in verse 40, yes, you're going to have into the countries. Okay. So, yeah. So if we go back in verse 40. So this is going to address the time of the end, 1798, and then 1989. And the king of the north is going to be the papacy with the United States. He shall come against him, the USSR, atheistic communism, like a whirlwind. So we know that whole history. And he shall enter into the countries. So again, this countries, I still think, is the same thing in verse 42. So again, you're going to have 776, the former Soviet bloc nations, and shall overflow and pass over, right? So, so we know that this is, this is giving us a, a summary of all of the symbols of the Sunday law, because we know that overflowing and pass over is the Sunday law, but it, it is also first being applied to the fall of the Soviet Union. So that means it's taking what happens in 1989 and the events of 1989 are typical of something. Yes, yeah, so of verse 42. Yes. So in verse 42, it's just going to repeat and enlarge. Does that make sense? So there's no reason to say, well, it's after the Sunday law, because it's just going to repeat the same, the same thing as in verse 40, but it's going to expand it. And, and what it's going to do when he stretches forth his hands upon the countries, it's going to be repeating what was in verse 40. But in this case, it's, it's, um, then going to com- also deal with the land of Egypt. And we've already argued that the dragon power moves from the Soviet Union to the UN. So Egypt here is going to represent uh, this unity that, that happens between the United States and the globalists. So as we move, as we progress through this Sunday law, we start to see that it's it's going to be even though Soviet Union is destroyed as, as as an entity, the dragon power isn't. And, and there's going to be this league made with this this power, right? So so stretching forth his hand upon the countries, 
In, in this case, I don't look at it as a bond of union completely. It's, it's a defeating of it, but it's, it's, it is also a control, right? So it's not so much like, you know, stri- setting his hand is different here than stretching forth his hand, even though that there are some parallels to it. And it, of course, we're just thinking through this here right now. And then it says, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold, silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. So the land of Egypt shall not escape, but this power that stretched its forth his hand upon the countries that defeated the Soviet Union, we have to say, well, when does he have power over the treasures of gold, silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt? Now, we could just say, well, that you can't buy or sell. That has to do with the Sunday law, right? Yes. And then we have the Libyans and the Ethiopians uh, shall be at his steps, which means shall be uh, the idea of being at his steps is in companionship. So that word uh, 4703, that means like to walk in step. So you're you're going together. You're walking together. They represent the rich and poor class. Yeah, so it's basically just everyone. Right. The, the rich and the poor alike. Um, yeah. So everyone's going to all the different classes are going to be in harmony with with this power. And that power is well, we have it as here as papal Rome. The question is, is it the pa- papal Rome that stretches forth his hand also upon the countries, which is the king of the north? Or, or does the United States. Is the United States the one that's stretching forth his hand is, I guess, the question. Is this talking about the United States making a unity with the dragon power? Because we could take verse 40 as the United States, verse 40b, as the United States with the papacy, because the United States becomes the military and the economic power that the papacy uses but, you know, could we say here that, that that this is really more the United States that stretches forth his hand upon the countries and that it's ultimately referring to this alliance? So in defeating the Soviet Union, the United States then makes a union with the power that was behind the Soviet Union, that is, the glo- globalists. Right. So I don't know. These are just thinking, thinking this through. But when we have he, do we just have it as papal Rome, or is he representing the United States, or is it just a combination of the two? Are we satisfied with he representing papal Rome in the historical application of verse 41 and 42? Yeah, I think it's papal Rome, but we know that the United States is the kind of the arm, in a sense, that the, the papacy uses to accomplish this okay. human world. Okay, so what if I did this, that his hand is the USA? Yes. Okay, so the papacy stretches forth his hand. That hand is the United States. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I like that better because it, it is the it is the force or the power, and he sends out his hand. Yeah, I like that. That's much better. Because first, in verse 41, he enters into the glorious land. Now, when we say that, like, in, we need to look at verse 40b as sort of encapsulating this whole history. Verse 41 is is going to repeat and enlarge. It gives us more details. Um, so it says it shows that that they're going to enter into the glorious land. The United States is being conquered by Rome. And many individuals will submit to Sunday legislation. But here it's not even so much about Sunday legislation. That is, it, it is about the Sunday law, but it isn't because the Sunday law is, is pretty broad reaching in this context. So it's not about the Sunday law itself because when they enter into the glorious land, we know that that's going to be in that history in 1989. And we don't have Sunday legislation. then. But it says, but these shall escape out of his hand. So I'm just going to put simply here, uh, submit to Rome instead of Sunday legislation um, because the legislation itself is going to come from the submission to Rome. It's the sign of that. 
But these shall escape out of his hand, refuse to submit to Rome. That is Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. So those are Protestants who recognize the man of sin. So that's, and now we're going to say that Edom, Moab, and Ammon in our history are going to represent three messages. You know, 11, 9, 19, July 18, 2020, and December 25th, 2021. But, but just in the history of it, it's, it's representing Protestants who recognize the man of sin. It's taking this from Ezekiel chapter, uh, 25, right? Does that make sense to people? That this, this, this makes a little more, it's a little clearer now. So then in verse 42, when it says he shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries. So this is referring, referring to the Soviet Union in that 776 days and the land of Egypt, which is the UN, which is where the dragon power moves from the Soviet Union to the UN shall not escape. Now, here we could have, you know, submitting to Sunday legislation, however we want to look at it. But I, I don't know. We could put submit to Rome. So I'm just going to put that. So instead of just legislation, just dealing with Rome. And but he and that's still going to be papal Rome shall have power over the treasures of gold, silver and over the precious things of Egypt. Right. So that means it's going to have control of the world. Through the U.N., now, why then does it mention the, the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps? Why would it mention that? What, how does that connect? Because if, if Rome, the papacy, has control over the economy and it has control um, or communion with, it's walking with, it's in step with the poor and the rich, what, what is that illustrating? Two classes. Okay, classes, but but they're rich and poor. I mean, they could have mentioned in different ways. We take it as rich and poor, but we know that it's it's referring us to to Revelation chapter thirteen, is it not? Yes, it is. Yeah. So verse sixteen of thirteen, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Okay that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So the reason why rich and poor are being mentioned there is it gives us a reference to the Sunday law and the mark of the beast, right? So this is the economic control of the world, and that's why rich and poor are mentioned. And, and it could be free and bond. They could have put something there. We could think of you know, the Libyans are poor, they're, they're slaves, the Ethiopians are rich, they're free, right? In just in a general sense. Okay, so that makes, that all makes sense in connection with the Sunday law. So this is the time of the image of the beast. So this fits in with what we've already understood. It's just a little clearer. The tidings out of the east and out of the north, right? So we've already understood that these are two different messages. The tidings out of the east are about the second coming of Christ and the tidings that come of the north are about the fall of Babylon. That is, this: the tidings are the loud cry of the third angel, the everlasting gospel. So, so this is the historical application of this and it's still future. Uh, they shall trouble him. Therefore, papal Rome shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly make away many. Now, this would probably be, of course, the universal Sunday law. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and and the glorious holy mountain. Yet yet he shall come to his end and, and none shall help him. Right. So we've got a lot of stuff written in there. But this would be referring to the period um, that uh, is just preceding the close of probation. Correct. Oh, yeah, it's just before. Right. So it's just before the close of probation. So this is this isn't the death decree Sunday law per se. It's just the universal Sunday law. And then we know Michael will stand up. That's chapter 12, verse one. So this is talking about stuff that's still going to happen. Obviously, the symbols then would have to imply or apply internally within the movement. Right. That's how we've been we've been addressing this. 
So if we go back and we want to say what some of these things represent, well, we say that that he has power over the treasures of gold, silver, and over precious things, that there is the control of the minds and the finances of the movement. Now, we would say, you know, in our history right now, that, um, I mean, definitely, if there's any money flowing into the movement, it's flowing into FFA at the present time. Right? We haven't set up any organization, you know, to collect funds and, and organize in that way. So FFA is going to have power over the treasures of gold, silver, precious things. And it says of Egypt, right, which in the historical application is the world. So, I mean, obviously that that would represent the movement in some way. And then we Jeff, have, what's that? Jeff began his uh, study on the Sabbath. Yeah. He's mentioned that his message is going, I think he mentioned like over 100 countries. Okay. The, the message, some testimony of somebody, somebody from India he began with. And, uh, so, yeah, you see it like a, a worldwide reach there going now with FFA again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, definitely, we're going to see FFA. Um, I mean, it's definitely bigger than not our movement or what's left, what we are part of, whatever it is. <laughs> now, you know, I, I'm not quite sure why. I mean, obviously, we know that, that God is going to have a movement that's going to take over the whole world. That's going to the gospel is going to go to the whole world. So, you know, at some point, whatever it is that we've done, whatever it is that God's done with this movement, it will have a worldwide influence at some point. But I don't think we as individuals will. And this has always been my conviction that, uh, that we're part of something. We're not the thing itself. And, and that's one of the things that really bothered me about Cabo and Parminder and even with FFA when they're looking at this idea of, you know, organizing, having this new church that, you know, we're going to call people out of Adventism into this other new organization with a new name. I still don't think that that's how the message is going to be accomplished from what I've seen in the spirit of prophecy. Obviously, we all have to study as individuals and study together with who's people who are of like mind. But when this work is done, there's not going to be a bunch of people who organize the work and are at the head of the work, so to speak. It's going to be Christ at the head of the work. And I understand why people like following people. It's it's easy to do, right? It's it's our human nature. I mean, it's it's one of the advertisers use. What's that, Jeff? I just said least resistance. Yeah, and, and you know, you know, people follow the crowd, right? I mean, it's just it's just what happens. Yeah, I've um, done it. I've done it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm sure all of us, you know, we've all been marketed to in some way or other, you know, we uh, buy Nike shoes because other people are wearing Nike or something. But you, you understand what I'm saying? It, yeah. You know, it, it is human nature. Like if if you're you're in a store and there's a bunch of people gathered around, you know, something that's on sale. You, you see women fighting over clothes or something. And if you're a woman, you know, you're going to run in there and uh, try to grab stuff, even though you have no idea if it's a good deal or not. You just see other people are going that direction, so it must be good, right? So so people like to follow people. It, it takes away individual responsibility to have to, to make a decision uh, to go against the crowd. That can be difficult. Uh, but we know as Seventh-day Adventists, we can think that we're very independent-minded, and in some ways we are, but in some ways Adventists are, are some of the worst at following the crowd because we think that we're in this exclusive church, this exclusive movement, and everybody just always wants to be the most exclusive. And that can be following the crowd as well, just as even though we can say we're in the minority. So the point is there's really no safety in following man. We have to study things for ourselves. 
And and God is has all kinds of people all over the world studying. Now, you know, I, I don't know about you know how many people are actually following FFA and accepting what Jeff is saying. I don't know. I know that you know my papers, thousands of people read my papers. How many people actually believe them? I have no idea. I mean, there are people who constantly follow and download my papers from uh, academia. And and sometimes we get really huge numbers of people watching the videos, but not many people watch them all the way through. So we just don't know who's studying. It, it just is not a good argument to say, well, because lots, it's the argument the church uses. Doesn't the church use the same type of argument? Lots of people have become Seventh-day Adventists, or we go into India and there's 10,000 people baptized in a day. And that's the evidence that, God is somehow leading or doing some great work right now, right? Well, he's planting the seed. He does plant the yeah. seed. Through but you know, other, churches, other churches could say the same thing, right? I mean, they can say, yeah, you know, we got all these people who joined our church. It's just not evidence of anything, right? So if you're going to present as evidence that lots of people are, you know, studying Jeff's papers all over the world, it's not evidence that Jeff is correct. It's it's a logical fallacy. We know God's work is going to go, but we also know that another work is going to go to the world. So what we do know from this verse, if we're going to look at the present truth application, I think we have enough evidence in, in verse 42 that the rejection of July 18th is an error. And that the ones who reject July 18th are go- are paralleling what happened with what's going to happen with papal Rome and the Sunday law. So it's not it's not a side you want to be on if you want to talk about sides. We just want to study and and look at these things openly. So when we get to verse uh, 44 and we deal with the loud cry of the third angel. So it says, uh, the loud cry of the third angel and the everlasting gospel joined, right? So, I mean, they're kind of the same thing. But the third angel is empowered. The tidings out of the east. So we know that that these can represent, uh, you know, the second coming of Christ. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, the message of Christ's second coming, and the message that Babylon is fallen. But in a present truth application, what would the east and the north represent? Okay. Can the message out of the East represent Islam and the message out of the North represent the Sunday law? As I put there. Those are both possible. And so if we're going to look at these tidings, the the loud cry of the third angel, the everlasting gospel joined, this has to be connected to the message of July 18, 2020. And why do I say that? I mean, it's easy just to put that in there. But what does the message of July 18, 2020 do? Announces to the world that a final warning has begun. Okay, but more specifically in context of what we see here, the loud cry of the third angel and the everlasting gospel joined, right? And and that is, I put them as joined because there's two things. There's a message about Islam and a message about the Sunday law, right? So that's how the message of July 18th joins the message of Islam, and the message of the Sunday law. How does it do that? So if we think about how we arrived at July 18, 2020, we have the prophecy of Ezekiel. What is Ezekiel's prophecy? It's about the destruction of Jerusalem, right? So another way we could look at this, we can look, oops, we can look at these symbols here. We arrived at the understanding of Islam with the 26th day of the fourth month. Right? That's the symbol there. All right. And, and now the Sunday law, of course, it's talking about Babylon has fallen, has fallen, but it's going to be the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and that's going to be the 10th day of the fifth month. Right? These two symbols, both of these symbols point to July 18, 2020. One to the Julian date, the 10th day of the fifth month, to the Julian date of July 18, 2020. And the other to the Gregorian, right? The 26th day of the fourth month is July 18, 2020. So there's something about the message of July 18th 
that ties in this prophecy of Ezekiel, right? And, and we'll just say the prophecy of Josiah, because that's what Ezekiel's prophecy is. And this one is Josiah Lich's prophecy. So we got these two things that are tied together. Now, it says, it shall trouble him. Now, troubling, of course, of the one that he, that is troubled or is fearful is, is who? Who's the him? We didn't put it there, but who's being troubled by these tidings? Well, it would be the papacy. Okay. And also prostate, uh, prostate Protestantism also. Yeah. So now... Now we could say how about this Satan. Now maybe not, but just I mean Satan's behind it all. But it says, you know, at least when he says he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly utterly make away many. You know, in First Peter five verse eight, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I mean, obviously, these powers are all satanic powers. And so, you know, we could just say it's the papacy. Um, but it's a satanic fury. Now here, um, you know, is it Satan that's frightened or is it the papacy that's frightened? I guess that's the question. There's in Ezekiel 22, 25 says, there is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey they have devoured souls they have taken the treasure and precious things they have made her many widows in the midst thereof I, I still think i'd probably just put the papacy in there but we know that satan is so we'll put papal power therefore he the pap papal rome shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many which is of course what Satan is seeking to do as well. But in this application, we'd have to say it's under the auspices of the papal power with the United States. But the papal power really behind it as far as a worldly power. So who's going to be fearful or frightened in our history? If who's who's being troubled, who's being fearful or frightened by the proclamation of July 18th? So this becomes a bit bit more of a problem. So, I mean, we're not going to say it's FFA, I don't think. But, you know, I'm not going to say, like, FFA is going to plant his tabernacles between the palace, of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, that I could apply that to FFA. I don't think I could. So that's why I was trying to move to say sort of more to who's behind this. But because if I was going to make an application, to the present, it's not so much about FFA or Jeff or anything. It has to do with what's inside of us. Is the message of July 18th amenable to human nature? So it definitely human nature does not. I mean, that's the reason why the message is rejected. So I guess the question is, how did this message trouble the movement? How did it trouble us? What does it do? We weren't prepared for what it really meant. Okay, so we're not prepared for what it means, right? Because we want a worldly message. You know, we're worldly, right? We're sinners living in this world. And our nature is enmity against God. It is enmity. It is not Christ's nature. And we need this, we need Christ's nature. We need his mind to overcome our nature. And what we see manifested in this movement, and we have, because it's us, right, is we see human nature being manifested. Jealousy, ambition, uh, uh, the ability to see the faults in others but not recognize faults in ourselves. This is what this message is supposed to, to show us, is our sinful condition. And this message troubles him now we can say well him you know who's him 
him could be in, in, in the present truth application, we could say, well, it's referring to FFA, it's referring to uh, the movement in some way. Um, but really, the one that is troubling is us, right? So I would say it troubles our human nature, that it goes against our nature. Now, then we have, therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. So, I mean, we know that historically this is going to apply to the Sunday law, but it has to apply to something that is happening within this movement within us. So because of what's in our human nature, so this prohibition to buy or sell, but at least what I'm going to say is, uh, the prohibition to listen to the message of July 18, 2020. That comes from our human nature. The idea that we're not going to listen to someone. See that Millerites? See that? When, there it is. <laughs> well, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. You know, it, it's always... You know, when you have to tell somebody to not listen to a message, uh, you know, the question I always am puzzled by is why it, it's like, if it's error, you can show that it's error. You know, an example of this, just dealing with the 2520. Um, you know, I know people that they wouldn't actually say 2520 out loud because they were scared of it. You know, they would say that number. They call it that number. And they said one time they got a video, and as soon as they saw that number, they closed down the video because they didn't want to become possessed. They didn't want to hear it because they might be deceived, right? So they, they won't even hear something. They won't even listen to something. Yeah, I see what you're saying there. The prophecy of Josiah is in Ezekiel. So when I say the prophecy of Josiah, that's Ezekiel. Because right. that's what he's using for the 309 years. Anyway, so my point going back here, the prohibition to listen to the message of July 18th, it is the result of human nature being fearful, fearful of hearing a message. And and um, so, so going forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many, um, you know, this is this is actually the work that that comes from this fear so I, I don't know exactly how to characterize it, but our human nature is going to fight against the truth now when it says he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain and we know historically this is the papacy you know planting its um its its throne Right, it's uh, it's uh, tabernacles, it's church, the tabernacles of his palace between the seas. That is the people and the glorious holy mountain, which is God's faithful people. Right. So between the truth and, and trying to keep the people from the truth, he shall come to his end. So the 144,000 are the glorious holy mountain, and then the papacy is going to be destroyed at the second coming. Now, of course, this is going to go all the way to the destruction of, of the papacy and Satan. And that's why in chapter 12, it's so in a sense, this is a, a summary of what's going to happen in Daniel chapter 12 when we have the close of probation says at that time, well, specifically at what time? At this time of the end situation connected with the Sunday law. Uh, Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And then we're going to have the time of trouble, right? Which is going to be the time of Jacob's trouble is included in that. And at that time shall thy people be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book, right? So that's that's going to just bring us to there. It's going to talk about the special resurrection, then the sealing up of the book of Daniel and so forth. So I don't know. I don't know exactly how we want to put in this present truth application, how 
Because I don't think we can just, you know, delineate it, you know, this represents this, this represents this, this represents this. I would say that we need to recognize that, that this is representing this message and its rejection within this movement. It's typified here under the Sunday law that's coming, but it's it's a test for us. Those that can pass this test can receive the seal of God and can uh, pass the Sunday law test. Can we see simply that the way in which the movement is presently acting and has been acting for a long time demonstrates that it is not, that we are not capable of passing the Sunday law test, that we're not truly converted. Can we see yeah. that? Okay. And yet many people believe that they are the true people, right? That is, they're the ones who have the truth and that they can actually block out people who don't accept what they're saying. And we need to recognize that God is, is trying to work with us. That, you know, we shouldn't have any like high thoughts about ourselves just because God has given us light. God has given us light because we're in darkness, not because we're some great people or anything like that. There's nothing that's recommending us to God other than our need. But we should be able to recognize not just in others, but in ourselves, the deficiencies that exist. Because when we look at this message, when we look at what God has given us, he's given us light, and, and he keeps giving us light. And he gives us this light to show, you know, what is true compared to what is false, because light will expose the, the hidden things in the darkness. But those hidden things are not something out there. There's something in here, in us, that we need to see. And Because it's just so easy to see the faults of others. It doesn't really take much. If you can see faults in others, that doesn't really say anything about you that's any good. Because even evil people can see the faults of others. And, and in a sense, we are evil, right? All of us are. But you understand what I'm saying. So we need to understand this message, what the message of July 18th is, because it's something that troubles our human nature. And if we are shutting out people from hearing the truth, like I think the thing that bothers me the most from from what I understand that Jeff is sort of saying, like if you're not in agreement with what we're teaching, you know, uh, we don't really want you in our midst. There's definitely no desire there to save anybody. Like if somebody doesn't agree with me, I want him to be in my midst. I want him to be in my studies. One is he may have something to share that I don't recognize. So I have something to learn from that person. Maybe, right? I don't know. But also if I'm presenting the truth, wouldn't I want that person there? If I believe I'm, I'm teaching the truth, wouldn't I want to have some difficult questions to be asked? Look at, look at what Jesus did. You know, he uh, yeah. all kinds of people. <laughs> Talk to all yeah, kinds we should, of people. We should be seeking to save the lost. And, and we, so, I don't know. It's just, when I look at what we have studied in Daniel chapter 11, because remember, we started studying Daniel chapter 11 because Colin wanted me to study it and i'm not sure what he was wanting that for why i needed to study it for him uh, i'm not particularly sh sure why that would matter but it definitely has been a profitable study so far and we still have more to do but we can see this present truth application uh speaks directly to us none of this justifies us in any way none of this appeals to our human nature None of this should be making us think that we're better than anyone else. Anyway, let's close in prayer and we'll come back to some of this stuff tomorrow. Dear Father in heaven, please be with each one of us today. Help us in our walk with you. 
And um, Lord, we pray that you can come close to each other, one of us, that you can convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, that we can be comforted by the fact that uh, we are sinners and you are loving and forgiving God who is willing to heal and restore us. We pray for those that we love, the people in this movement, friends and family, and those that we come in contact. We ask that we can influence them for good and that we can be changed in character. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.